And with that, we will head over to our next presentation. Welcome, Martin. Thank you. Yes. Glad to be here again. Yeah. Second time around. Mm -hmm. You were yeah. like one and a half year ago, I think you were here. About and that, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And today you're going to present making a game in Elm and Lamdera. Actually, your own game that you made. My own game, yeah. Yes. Very, I think it's very cool. I've seen uh, some of the slides already. It's very fun. <laughs> For us, born in the late 70s, this is uh, a game that will uh, talk to you, I would say. With that, I'll uh, head over to you. I'll hand it over to you, Martin. Thank you. Hit it away. Yeah. Um, so as mentioned, the title is Making a Game. <coughs> Excuse me. Making a Game in Elm and Lamdera, and I'm Martin Stewart. So. Sorry, just lining up the slides. Uh, town Collab is the name of it. <clears throat> it's a multiplayer town building game. So the idea is you and some friends can hop on. It's like a big shared infinite canvas. And you can place down houses, trees, roads, railroads. And there's no real objective to it. There's no real win or lose conditions. Uh, you could think of it in SimCity in that regard. You just build for the sake of building. Um, it's made using Elm and Lamdera. Elm, perhaps you're familiar with. It's a uh, functional programming language designed to be uh, simple. Its own marketing term refers to it as delightful. Um, and it's designed for making web apps and websites. Lamdera is a framework that uses Elm so that you can write Elm both on the front end and the back end. So as, as I just mentioned, Elm is intended for the making the website. Lamdera is uh, a framework that helps you write back in code with Elm also. Um, on top of that, Lamdera helps with, uh, uh, it makes migrations type safe, it makes communication between the front end and back end type safe. Um, you don't need to worry about how you're going to do hosting or deployment. Lamdera takes care of it for you. It's very handy. And as some background to this, uh, this game, Town Collab, I tried to make it, we'll say four years ago, plus or minus a year. I tried to make it, um, but I used Elm on the front end, of course, and C Sharp on the back end. Uh, uh, I'm not giving this presentation as of three years ago because that version went nowhere because the issue I ran into was that having two separate languages, one for the front end, a different one for the back end, is that I end up rewriting the game logic twice um, because the, the server needs to run the same game logic to, to, to keep things in sync. Uh, but with Lamdera, that problem solved. Elm on both spots. Um, this game is inspired by an old children's game called Lego Loco, um, which maybe some of you have heard of. Maybe I'm the only one who enjoyed it as a kid. Uh, you can think of it as this game, but no multiplayer. Uh, you're stuck to a, uh, your, your world is the size of your screen, um, and there's no undo. Those are things that are hard to go back to, even if I have a lot of nostalgia for it. So I wanted to make my own version of that. Okay, so that's enough describing this. What does it actually look like? Well, as you might have already guessed, um, we're looking at it now. Uh, this is the website, the game. Um... Yeah, and you know, you can place down houses, trees, flowers, roads. There's a train looping around. Um, but in this talk then, I would like to connect this a bit with functional programming because, you know, given that I wrote this in Elm, um, there's a bit of functional programming that comes in in how I designed it. So two topics in particular I'd like to talk about is how networking is handling, how, excuse me, how network is, networking is handled. So that would be the communication between the front end and back end, how multiple players can stay in sync. There's not uh, race conditions, for instance. Um, and the other thing is how the uh, graphics are drawn. Uh, WebGL is used in this case, but how that done is something I will go into detail. All right, networking. So there's two systems involved here. One's responsible for placing tiles. So by placing tiles, I mean like placing the buildings or placing the roads. And the other system is responsible for moving trains and cursors. So by cursor, here's my cursor. 
if anyone else was playing right now, they would also be able to see my cursor moving around. And likewise for trains, of course, everyone can see the train moving. So starting with placing tiles then. Uh, the best way I have to describe it is to use an analogy with Git. So hopefully everyone uses Git as their uh, versioning control, but this might apply to other version control systems as well. So in this view here, on the left, we have Git history. So you can imagine here, we're starting off with, we have our main branch, and first one person placed flowers. So we're gonna call this the flower commit. And then someone placed a rock. That's our rock commit. And on the right here, inside this little black fence, that is what we're imagining as what we see within the web app. So we're on the main branch, we have the latest commit, and because of that, we see the flowers and the rock in our little um, fenced off view. Okay, so let's suppose now we have a race condition. Oh no, on the main branch, someone else has merged in their commit. They've added the bus stop. And on our local branch, we've added a elm tree. Um, so the problem now is these two things have been placed at the same time and we're still they've been placed at the same spot. So right now we see the elm tree um, that might hint to how this conflict gets resolved. But let me explain what happens. So as I just said, the bus stop gets placed, the tree gets placed, they're in the same spot. So locally, we have our own branch and the local branch contains all of the changes that the server has not confirmed that it has yet. So we've just placed down a tree and you know, we don't want to wait for the server to confirm our change. We want to see it immediately at our end because otherwise, you know, the UI feels unresponsive if you have like 500 milliseconds delay between clicking and seeing the object placed. So local branch, those are our changes. Only we see them. Uh, the main branch, those are commits that have been confirmed by the server. Everyone sees them. So in this case, we have the bus stop, we have the tree. We only see the tree at the moment because that's what we placed. And so the next step then is what I would refer to as a rebase. We get the bus stop commit from the server and, or, and the way we handle it is we take our local branch and we rebase it on the latest main commit. So that would mean then we take our tree and we rebase it from the bus stop. So what's happened is we have this flower that got placed, we have the stone that got placed, then the bus stop, then the tree, in that order. So I'm going to do a little instant replay now to make it clearer why we see what we see in the fenced off area. Specifically, you might have noticed what happened to the rock. So I'm going to just enable the UI here for a moment. And so if we start from scratch here in our view, First the flower showed up, then the rock showed up, then the bus stop showed up, and you notice the bus stop knocked away the rock just because of how it was placed. And then our tree got placed, and it knocked away the bus stop. So this is how conflicts are handled. Let me just hide the UI now. This is how conflicts are handled within the game, is that each change is treated like a commit. Each, each action is treated like a commit. And while you're waiting for your commit to be confirmed by the server, you have it on a local branch. And if you get into anyone else's changes, then you take all your local changes and you replay them from the latest uh, main branch or the latest main commit. So here at the end then, we see that now the server has confirmed that we placed the elm tree. So that's on the main branch and our local branch is empty because we don't have any outstanding commits. And so we end up with just the flower and the tree. And here I've been just talking about placing items, but actually this is more general than that. For example, if we were to hit control Z, undo or change, that would be a new commit, the undo commit. So that would get placed on top of the existing history and then everyone else would be notified when it's broadcast to them that, okay, this user undid their tree placement. And so the tree would be removed for everyone. And all of this, this would be handled in a uh, way that's race, race condition free. There's no risk of um, 
the order in messages causing people to see different versions of uh, our tiles. Um, moving on. So the train, trains and cursors, in contrast, let me just slide up the slide. There we go. Um, for trains and cursors, there's a different system. Here we're only interested in the latest cursor position or the latest position of a train. We're not interested in the history of like who placed what in what order. Because in, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. If, if I move my cursor around, it doesn't matter what order event other cursors were moved in. Because my cursor is just its own position. It doesn't, uh, it's not affected by anyone else's cursor position. Um, in addition to that, oh, excuse me, I, I should have mentioned earlier, with the other system, it's very important that when you are replaying events, so here, let me go back up here. When we, when we uh, rebase and we need to replay events to figure out where all the tiles are sitting, it's very important that it's consistent in how you end up in your final state. Like every commit, every change should have the same um, effect. You might, you know, as functional programmers, we think, well, obviously pure functions. And yeah, pure functions make this very easy. The fact that we're working with functional programming means, well, I should say, Elm is a pure, a pure, pure functional language. So all the functions in Elm are pure functions. Uh, no exceptions to that, which means there's no way to accidentally screw this up, which is really nice because debugging multiplayer race conditions is one of the hardest things you can do. So uh, there's certainly advantage there uh, in contrast to other uh, functional programming languages that are, uh, we say, more flexible, that have escape hatches. Um, anyway, um, yeah, so for trains and cursors, we don't need the complexity of handling race conditions because it doesn't matter. For trains, we're just broadcasting, or the server, I should say, is just broadcasting all the time the latest train position. And once we have the train position, we estimate how long the network latency is and just simulate the train position slightly ahead of the position we got. Uh, and it works well enough. If there's, if there's any hiccup, you know, it'll be corrected by the next update of train position coming from the server. So there's no worry of desyncs there because we're just, if there was a desync, it's corrected half a, half a second later. Okay. That was networking. How about rendering? So as I mentioned earlier, uh, rendering is done using WebGL. Specifically, there's a uh, package in the Elm ecosystem called uh, Elm, Elm Explorations WebGL. Um, the, the advantage this has over just doing direct browser API calls for WebGL, uh, it's type safe, and also it's, um, it's much easier to use. So specifically what I mean by that is normally when you're doing WebGL, or just OpenGL in general, really. You need to be very careful about how you're setting up buffers. You need to compile your own GLSL programs. Those are your shaders for drawing things. You need to make sure the data and your attributes and your buffers and your uh, frame buffers and all that sort of stuff is of the correct format for what your shader expects. Um, and if you do any of this wrong, just about anything wrong, you'll get a blank screen. And with a cryptic error message, and you'll need to spend a while Googling and scratching your head before you figure out what's going wrong. In contrast, then, the Elm Explorations WebGL package, because it's type safe, if I try to pass in data to a shader and the types don't match, it's a compiler error. So it's caught immediately, and Elm is notable for having very good error messages. And uh, that is the case here as well. Um, on top of that, so the funny thing is Elm is known for being a very uh, simple language. Uh, it has similarities to Haskell and like surface level details, but it's much more like it's, um, its syntax is much more simple. Um, but despite having a simple syntax, Elm does have built-in GLSL support, which is to say you can write your own WebGL shaders in line in your Elm code. There's a special notation for the start and end of your shader, and then inside of that is just normal WebGL shader code. Um, 
So this is, I don't know, I find it a little ironic that Elm's a simple syntax, but oh, but also has this. But I'm not complaining because it's enormously helpful here. Um, yeah, so with all of this um, available, it's pretty straightforward to put together a game using Elm that uses WebGL. Um, oh, uh, another thing, uh, because this is Elm and everything's pure functions, the way that this works, in normal uh, WebGL, you're, it's extremely stateful. You have lots of different flags you're setting, and you're responsible for making sure the flags, uh, and by flags, I mean like Boolean values, like on-off switches for various attributes. They're set the way you expected. And it's very easy to like forget that, oops, this piece of code, it sets like uh, depth checking to being disabled. And other code elsewhere is expecting it to be enabled. And now I'm wondering, why are my triangles rendering through each other like I have x-ray vision? Um, in contrast, the WebGL package for Elm, um, you uh, define up how things are drawn in a declarative way, and then the package itself figures out how to efficiently uh, enable and disable flags to do what you expect it to do. So yeah, uh, all really handy stuff. Okay, but more concretely then, in context of this game, um, the way rendering is done, we have uh, the tiles, so like the, the fence around the cow, for example, or the houses that you saw earlier. Those are all what I refer to as tiles. And they're rendered in 16 by 16 chunks. Um, this is for performance reasons. If, if, for example, instead I was just drawing everything visible on screen all as one giant uh, mesh, and by mesh I mean like vertices, uh, triangles, um, if I did that, then as soon as I move the camera, I need to redraw everything, which is slow. So I'm doing a tile-based approach where I have 16 by 16 tiles. Uh, when new tiles are needed to be shown, then I create that 16 by 16 tile. But then after that, I can cache it, and tiles that are no longer visible are removed. Um, in uh, Town Collab, everything is a quad. So uh, rectangles, essentially, two triangles fixed together like that. Um, and then within the quad, I use a texture lookup to draw the various uh, images you see. So the sprites, as they're referred to as. Um, and all the sprites are on a single giant image. So that's uh, what's referred to as a texture atlas. Um, and actually, I can show you real quick what that looks like if I just go back to the browser view. Here's the, all the... Uh, uh, textures, all the sprites that can be shown in the game. So, for example, we were just looking at the fence. And if I zoom in a bit, there's the fence, there's the cow. Uh, you might be wondering, uh, wasn't the cow black and white? What's, uh, what's going on with the cow here? And so that's the one thing I do in this game, is that there are uh, a very specific shade of magenta and cyan. Uh, and, and uh, various uh, shades of those two colors that are swapped out while the game is running. And so these become user-defined colors. Essentially what I've done is I've written a WebGL shader. Uh, and I, sorry, I should have clarified earlier. By shader, I mean it's a program that the GPU runs. So it's a, its its own special language. Um, and this program I've written then for the GPU, it looks at every pixel value in the texture. And if it sees this particular color, it says, oh, OK, I know. I swap that out with a different color. Um, and that's how then I can have the black and white cow here. And the fence is orange, not pure magenta. Likewise for the text, it's uh, black here. Which, um, if you are very uh, eagle-eyed, you might have realized at this point that the, uh, the little hyphen or bullet point I have here um, Sorry, let me get back to the main screen. The hyphen I have here, it's actually a bench. Um, that's why I wanted to include this, because it makes the uh, game much more flexible in what I, I can show without needing to literally draw all the uh, pixel art for it. Um, an exception to all of this, I just mentioned that everything's quads and a texture atlas. Um, an exception to this is the map view. So I have this uh, map you can also look at that gives you a more distant perspective. 
which is yet very useful on smaller screens like this one. Um, it's still a work in progress. You might notice that there's uh, the, the black pixels and the green pixels in the center, the dark green pixels, but then they kind of vanish on the rest of the map, and that's because while I can show the, the, the mountain range and I can show all, where the, all the water is uh, automatically because it's just uh, it's using uh, uh, simplex noise to generate the, uh, the geography, the actual tiles being placed. I only know about the tiles that are loaded within, uh, within my nearby position. Uh, so there's nothing else to show. That's why the, uh, the black and the green, which represent nature and uh, 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 buildings and, and such, are not shown elsewhere. Uh, still a work in progress. If I hadn't mentioned that before, this game is still a work in progress. Um, anyway. Because we're using WebGL, um, uh, and specifically because I'm using WebGL not only for what you're seeing here, but all the UI as well, uh, I can achieve what I like to call the zero DOM experience. Um, the advantage with this, or I should clarify first what I mean. If I just open up the um, browser window here and I look at elements, there's a canvas, and that's it. I mean, you know, you have all the other standard stuff, but the canvas is responsible for drawing everything you see. The advantage of this is that I have full control, and I have full control over both how the UI looks and how it feels. Um, this is really helpful with games where you're, like if you're making a typical website, you just want it to look like a typical website. But games, you typically want to have your own look um, on top of that, I don't want to worry about like, oh, the game looks fine on Chrome, but on Safari, no, there's some bug, and now it's broken over there. There is still that with other things like audio APIs and whatnot, and, and also WebGL has slight variations. Uh, oh, I forgot to mention that earlier. Uh, there is one very annoying variation between browsers, which is that when you load a texture, Sometimes the default settings for how the texture loads is different between browsers. And so some browsers think it's okay idea to just mess with the colors a little in my texture, which would be unnoticeable in most cases, except, you know, I just mentioned that thing where I need a very specific version of Magenta to swap it out. And so I had some friends asking me, hey, your game's kind of cool, but why is everything purple? <laughs> like, oh, and it took forever to debug that one. Um, Sorry, a bit of a tangent. Anyway, so yeah, having uh, full control over the UI is really nice for making games. Um, but it does, some, it does have some disadvantages. So accessibility is a big one. Um, I do have keyboard navigation built in, so you can jump between buttons using tab and shift tab. But in general, it's not as good as a typical website would be. Like, even a website where the uh, developers have put no thought into accessibility, the browser can look at the DOM and figure out how someone using a screen reader, for example, ought to see the website. Um, and in my case, what DOM? So the screen readers can't do anything. I think in this case, it's a bit more OK because it's a game. Everything's very graphical anyway. So uh, a screen reader, I don't think, would be appropriate. Um, but, but it is, you know, a concern, and especially why this is not something that's done everywhere. Uh, though I should note, I think there's a number of uh, Rust, uh, Rust crates, they're called, yes. Rust crates that do the same approach where they have a single canvas. But what they do is, in the background, they also build up a, a, a DOM that's purely for screen readers um, to, to work around this. Um, so I, I could do that, but, but again, um, making a game, that's not exactly the focus. Another disadvantage is throughput. So because I'm doing all the DOM-related computations myself, um, it's just slower. Because I'm going through JavaScript and at, the end, at the end of the day. Elm's compiling to JavaScript. JavaScript's running on this. And it's not as fast as the very carefully fine-tuned uh, coded C++ or Rust that the browser's running in. 
Um, but on the other hand, a typical website is built with throughput in mind and not latency. So for games, because I'm building something that's designed to render 60 frames per second, uh, latency is a much greater concern. And so by doing it in WebGL, I can have a very low latency. And so I don't need to worry about like trying to do some kind of animation and the game is stuttering because, oh, there was a garbage collection or a layout computation that just happened. Um, so yeah, um, I'm moving on. Okay, I just talked about this UI a whole bunch. What does it actually look like? Well, you saw it a little bit earlier, but I'm going to show it in more detail now. So um, this, I was earlier in presentation mode. Now I'm in the mode that a typical user would see. So down at the bottom here is just all the possible tiles that can be placed. So for example, I could pick the brick house and I could stick it here. Or I could go over to this little text input in the bottom right and I can decide that, I know, Red is such a stereotypical brick house color. Let's go for, uh, yeah, let's go for purple, or maybe that's magenta. So yeah, magenta house, looking good. Um, and yeah, you just mess around. It's there's no real objectives. You just build whatever you want to build. You can place text as well. And say, howdy. Um, there's you know a settings page. Mine looks a little different because I'm the admin. And you can like invite friends to join over here in the top right. It's a little like, well, it's a little hard to see now with all the tiles below it, but it's a invite tree. So it shows the root user, which is me, and then everyone I've invited, and then everyone they've invited, and so forth. Um, yeah, so that's the general idea. Um, and that about wraps up what I wanted to talk about here. Um, but one more thing that I couldn't really fit in, but I really want to show. So one thing this game supports is sending mail to each other. So over here, we have this building that says test user. So this person named test user, this is their uh, post office. And the orange flag here, that means they have a letter that they want to send. And I happen to know it's a letter they want to send to me. So I can click on this train here to get it to uh, head out and it'll stop at their post office and pick up a entire wagon for this single letter. And then it'll reach my place. And I got the letter. Oh boy. So I'm gonna click on that now. And you see here, I have lots of other letters. Um, we're going to ignore those. Um, but I can click on the new one. And that's all folks. Uh, the URL at the bottom, if you're interested, you can look at all the slides. Uh, look, if you look go to this URL here, there's a, there's a zero at the end there. Don't miss the zero. It's a little hard to see. I couldn't fit the whole URL in the, in the mail. Uh, but yes, that's all, folks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. Very, very cool. And as always, I'll start by saying we'll share the link below in the... That might be easier. <laughs> in the description here. So yeah. if you're watching this in, 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 in uh, retrospect, the link is in the description. We'll also share it on the, on the Meetup page. So okay. people can come and click. Um, spontaneous question. Have you ever thought like gathering a group of friends and you're sitting around and, and doing stuff and sharing everything on a big screen? Or maybe you've already done that. It seems like the obvious game, you know. Yeah. Fight your friends, uh, pop I a beer, <laughs> and just <laughs> draw away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have gotten some friends together. I think we were like a group of, I don't know, six people. Mm -hmm. had, like three sessions. Um, and yeah, it was fun. It's like... It's, it's a certain type of person who would enjoy this game because I'm certain a lot of people want games that are more focused oh, okay. on something mm -hmm. rather than just placing tiles. But, yeah. well, if you liked Lego or Lego Loco, that old game, then I think you'll enjoy this as well. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, you also said No Doom. It's really icing another. Uh, we have had other presentations here on this, uh, on this uh, meetup uh, around Elm and No Doom, No JavaScript. It seems really... Mm, interesting as i've been working yeah. sometimes with javascript and so on <laughs> um are there more work with webgl instead of throwing out the doom and then getting into webgl is it more work for you is it more work as a developer to to get it to work and uh, uh certainly reaching hello world status takes a lot more work even yeah. with this elm package that simplifies things yeah. um just just text in general is something that's 
quite difficult when you're doing WebGL. Mm -hmm. um, the like as an indication of that, when you're doing uh, WebGL, you the the first thing you'll typically do is not called Hello World. It's called Hello Triangle, mm -hmm. and it's drawing a rainbow. Well, not quite rainbow. It's mm -hmm. a it's a triangle with a green, a blue, and a red point. Mm -hmm. Color blending between them. Um, to get to the point where you have text, you need to load in the texture. You need to make your own shader that reads uh, from that texture. Uh. Uh, you need to make sure the quad you've created to draw that texture on is lined up correctly so it's not stretched horribly. Or it, and it also needs to be lined up with the device pixels on your screen. Mm -hmm. So typically, when you're a web developer, you're thinking in terms of CSX, CSX pixels. So you're not worried about... When you think pixel, yep. typically you think of a pixel that's larger than the actual physical pixel. Mm -hmm. For example, when you're on your smartphone, like you might think, oh, my smartphone is 375 pixels wide. Mm -hmm. That's not true, actually. It's mm -hmm. wider than that, but the uh -huh. pixels have been like compressed multiple pixels are in a single CSX mm. pixel because you don't want the UI to be device to if the text was 12 point font with device pixel size it would be tiny mm. so this is what they do to accommodate that so you, you don't need to think about it normally but with WebGL you do mm. if you don't account for this everything's blurry <laughs> so there's lots of stuff like that um, but once you have it set up then yeah it's actually kind of easier because there's so much you know Filling with the DOM, you don't mm -hmm. need to worry about. Cool. I have a question. Oh. I think you mentioned it one last time that you were that there was no way to load assets on the demand on demand, and everything must be loaded up front. Uh, are they referring to the previous presentation I gave here? Maybe. Okay. Yeah. Um, that's not quite true. Um, and I should clarify. Um, this uh, the Elm Explorations WebGL package. Uh, has some limitations around what you can do. Mm -hmm. um, it is trickier to load textures and meshes on demand, uh, specifically because there is no real good way to unload meshes and textures at this point. Uh, the way it works at the moment is um, you wait for the garbage collectors to just notice, oh, well, you don't have, you don't have a reference to that buffer ID anymore. Mm. And then in the background, there's a weak table uh, that's also holding a reference to that buffer ID. And when it sees the buffer ID is a lot of released from memory, it goes to the GPU and tells mm -hmm. it, okay, you can release that memory. But uh, garbage collectors being what they are, you cannot rely on this happening in a uh, timely manner. So I, I think that's my, might've been what I was talking about yeah. last time. Cool. Another question, are you in your daytime job? Are you working with uh, Elm? Uh, or are you working with other like JavaScript, like a lot of people. Oh, I can do one better than working with Elm. I'm yeah. working with Elm and Lambdera. Oh, um, cool. So at my day job, actually, um, I'm working at a company called Ambu, and um, we're, we're it's a UK company. Yeah. Uh, we're working with uh, helping people insulate their homes, oh. and specifically, my job then is to make a web app that lets people view their house as a 3D model. So we have a floor plan of their oh. house. And so my job is to parse that floor plan. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a, the format's called IFC and is the most object-oriented 30 years ago format. <laughs> of course. <laughs> but um, once that's parsed, then yeah, 3D model of that with a viewer. So it's a lot of WebGL mm -hmm. and Elm and Lambda in my day job too. So yeah, I'm Ooh, very happy cool. about that. I'm going to ask you the same question. Do you, do you feel that you have, a, like, is it easy to uh, recruit people? Uh, so at Ambu... Fine people or maybe you don't need to find people so at ambu i've not worked there too long we haven't had a need to hire any more programmers mm. yet um i suspect we won't need to hire any for a while mm. but my impression from past jobs is that uh as a elm programmer it's hard to find jobs <laughs> as a elm employer it's very it is. easy yeah <laughs> which yes happy for the the, the employers out there exactly <laughs> All employers, listen, yeah. it's easy, easier to find functional programmers. Just just write a message in Elm Slack if you want to hire someone. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Here you go. Yes. I have no more questions. Again, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you for having yeah, me. Yeah, you're welcome. And you will be welcome again if you want to present more. With that said, everyone, thanks for tonight. And as always, if you or someone you know should present, just reach out to me. Uh, you'll find me on um, 
meetup, LinkedIn, Twitter, wherever. Just reach out to me uh, and we'll put you on stage. With that, thank you very much and have a nice evening, everyone. Bye.